Good morning and welcome to the uh, press conference introducing the 43rd annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. My name is Adrian Monk, I'm Head of Communications here at the Forum and I'm joined in this press conference by Founder and Executive Chair of the World Economic Forum, Professor Klaus Schwab, and by colleagues on the Managing Board, Alois Schwingi, Borger Brenda, Lee Howe, and by the Forum's Chief Economist, Jennifer Blanke. Um, we'll be hearing from each of them about the individual aspects of this year's program and this year's meeting. But I want to begin by asking Professor Schwab what exactly it is about the meeting that is so special and so different. Professor Schwab. Good morning. Thank you, Adrian. Of course, there are many meetings in the world. You have the G20, you have the G8. And the question is, why is Davos so successful? And I would present to you four reasons why Davos is different. First, it's the most comprehensive and representative meeting of global leaders. You have, of course, the politicians, and you will hear from my colleague, most governments are represented in a strong way in Davos. You have all the heads of international organizational, regional development banks, multilateral organizations. You have the CEOs of most of the 1,000 foremost global companies. You have the heads of each major global NGO. You have, in addition, the young generation, very well integrated through our young global leaders, through our global shapers, the new category of forum communities. You have, uh, from civil society, not only the NGOs, the trade unions, prominent trade union leaders, uh, you have a, a cultural and um, religious leaders. I should also mention, of course, the intellectual dimensions, the intellectual leaders whom you have in Davos. When you look at the participants list, you will feel that the heads, the presidents of the 30 plus most renowned uni uh, universities around the world are integrated. You have women leaders. So sometimes the... the uh, uh, question how many women leaders uh, participate. Actually, you have more than 400 women leaders and many organizations who organize uh, summits for women leaders would be probably jealous to have such a uh, strong uh, women leaders constituency. I should also add uh, the disruptors whom we have in Davos, uh, in technologies, the technology pioneers, and finally, um, very important, the media leaders. I think every fifth participant is a media leader. Now, this just reflects the nature of the World Economic Forum. It was established as a multi-stakeholder organization. We believe that the big issues in the world cannot be solved by governments, business, or civil society alone. We need a cooperative platform. So there's a second reason why Davos is different. It's the most systemic, interdisciplinary approach uh, to the global agenda. Usually you have meetings devoted to one or two or three different subjects. But here in Davos, um, we look at all the issues on the global agenda in an interconnected way. This is, by the way, also the reason why some of the governments or practically most of the governments are represented by multiple ministers. I just take the example of uh, Germany. Uh, of course, uh, you will hear uh, later uh, about the Chancellor, but there is also the Vice Chancellor for Economic Affairs, there is the Minister of Finance, there is the Minister of Social Affairs, there is the Minister of uh, Development, and uh, there is the Minister of Health. And foreign affairs. And in each of those issues, uh, those uh, people are engaged. So it's the most uh, multidisciplinary uh, meeting. Third reason why it's different, it is the most interaction oriented meeting. Um, Davos is not built around some stars. Everybody in Davos should be a star. We have 1,400 active roles, 1,400 
uh, active roles for uh, participants, and there are more than 400 public and private sessions. So everybody is engaged in Davos, and that provides a very special atmosphere. Finally, um, I, Davos is different because it's not a formal decision-making meeting with communiques at the end. It is a laboratory for new ideas, actually, and a testing ground and launching pad for new initiatives. So you will see again in Davos quite a number of new initiatives. And I should add, it's an informal platform for resolving uh, disputes. Now, what is my personal expectation for Davos this year? Number one, I hope that we can approach uh, our global affairs with more optimism. And this is also expressed in our theme, which will be developed by my colleague Lee Howell. I hope we can recreate, again, more globalism. Um, we had recently a preparatory meeting here of uh, representatives of international organizations and governments. Uh, and there is a fatigue now in, in globalism. Uh, so is even the feeling of a possible backlash. Uh, so we want to restore this notion of global trusteeship, uh, which is so important to address our global issues. And my third um, wish for Davos is that participants come back with more civic um, mindedness, which means uh, feeling a greater responsibility for society as a whole. And ultimately, this means uh, a stronger uh, moral accountability and responsibility. Thank you. Professor Shaw, thank you very much. I'm going to turn now to my colleague, <coughs> Lee Howe, who heads up the team that develops the, both the theme and the program. Lee, you've had to develop over 250 sessions, drawing on the talents of some 2,500 people. How have you gone about preparing this year's program for Davos? Thanks, Adrian. I, um, we go about it, really, if I want to go back to actually Professor Schwab's points about uh, the stakeholder, bringing all the stakeholders together, and of course, being multidisciplinary. Um, and I could say that uh, the program is developed uh, the day after the prior year's annual meeting, but in a very systemic way where we reach out to all our communities, our members and partners, our constituents. But I would like to highlight one group. One group that's quite interesting here is uh, our members of our Global Agenda Councils. Professor Schwab highlighted really this multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder approach to global issues. Well, we have over 1,500 experts coming from business, international organizations, national governments, uh, universities, think tanks, et cetera. And they work together throughout the year and serve a two-year term and to help build the program. Uh, first and foremost, by helping us, for example, last week we had uh, the two weeks ago the launch of the Global Risk Report. Uh, they were instrumental in that, but also consulting and working with us to really reshape these, these issues. And I believe uh, there is a, um, a the press gathered here today uh, will have a, a chance to think of, uh, to, to, to actually um, appreciate some of their thinking in a broader context with the global agenda, the outlook on the global agenda report that we have with them. Uh, we call it the global, uh, global Outlook 2013. But they're very instrumental. I just want to highlight their contribution. And of the 1,500, over four, nearly 400 of them will be President Davos, active in, in these various sessions. Now, to the point about the, the, the program itself, um, clearly uh, it's built around the theme. And the theme is um, <clears throat> resilient dynamism. And, and I would just simply express it as follows. In an interdependent world, we are facing a number of risks. Uh, we're very aware of that. Uh, they're exogenous, external. These are future shocks, and we have to be resilient. But that's not sufficient alone to get us out of it. And this is the point of the, uh, Professor Schwab and the optimism, the leadership. We, we do need dynamism. We need to get back onto a path of where we want to be, not where we were in the sense of we wanted to deal with these past risks, well, that's not going to prevent, you know, actually going to lead us to a better future. We have to actively pursue that future. And what I would express to the people around the, the organizing principle around this theme, it's a bit counterintuitive, but in order to deal with risks, you have to take risks. And I think that's what we're hoping to see is that, that leaders will be open to in, being innovative, being bolder, taking these risks, because they do have to, of course, acknowledge and address the risks that society is concerned about. And that's how we built the program. 
Uh, in the program, I would just say is that, uh, as always, focusing on the global, regional industry, but also the broader societal agenda issues. And uh, I welcome you all to go through the, the program that you have with you, but I would like to highlight uh, three areas, if I may, um, that I think would be. One is, of course, very much focused on the global economy. Some of my colleagues here will speak to that, but we do have really the top economic teams in Davos from the various countries uh, and economies, but also from the key international organizations, as, uh, along with uh, industry, uh, et cetera. But, but the key point is there is a, very much a focus around bringing dynamism back into the global economy and also dealing with some of the risks that we, we face with respect to uh, challenges revolving around uh, protectionism, nationalism, populism, such that we, we, we talked about earlier. So I just want to highlight that point. The second is that we also very much focused around what's happening geopolitically. And there are a number of exciting sessions that Borge Brende will touch upon because we do have the leaders in, in these regions present with us to look at what is happening in North Africa, uh, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, et cetera. And uh, I just want to highlight that we've given a lot of emphasis on, on the regionals this year. And we have a number of televised sessions with regional media partners. Uh, we've expanded our coverage in that sense. And I want to highlight that. And of course, third is uh, little known, but we spend a lot of time on innovation. We have a great, a great assembly of scientists and technologists in Davos. And if you're, Adrian asked me what's sort of my highlight of the program, is really around the ideas labs where we work with top teams of scientists and, and, and really innovators and technologists from universities to, to really think about what's next that's really going to help us and change our lives in a very positive way. And uh, I find that very inspiring, uh, along with the fact that we have so many Nobel laureates. And I just would highlight the other one session, of course, is when we ask these Nobel laureates to really express what they think is really important in the state of the world today. So uh, it's a very rich program, but I wanted to highlight those three elements uh, just uh, for, for the media here. Thanks, Lee. Um, turning now to my colleague, Bulga Brenda. Bulga, this year, there's, uh, there's usually uh, a strong participation by public figures, but it seems to have risen to extraordinary levels this year. Can you just talk us through exactly who's coming from, from the public space politically and civil society? Thank you, Adrian. Uh, it's correct that it is unprecedented participation from governments and international organizations this year at our annual meeting. We have close to 50 head of states and governments coming to Davos, and more than 300 at cabinet level or representatives from international organizations. We know that uh, reviving economic growth, jobless growth, the situation in Syria, but also the post-2015 agenda on the Millennium Development Goals are crucial for uh, the international organizations. And we will have Secretary General Ban Ki-moon addressing all these questions. We will also have uh, Madame Lagarde from IMF uh, talking about economic outlook uh, for 2013. And also the quite newly elected president of the World Bank, Dr. Kim, will also be in Davos. Altogether, more than 35 international organizations will be with us. We will, of course, have a special focus on the Eurozone and Europe. Europe has been through uh, tremendous reforms this year. And maybe even more important one has built the framework that will secure not going into the same situation in the future. And some of the architects or the, the architects of this new system will be with us in Davos with Chancellor Merkel, as Professor Schwab uh, also mentioned. We will also have then the head of ECB, uh, Draghi, that has played a very crucial role. We will also have uh, Prime Minister Cameron, that is also has the presidency of G8 uh, this year, will be uh, in Davos. We will also have uh, Prime Minister Monti um, of Italy, that has started uh, reforms in his country. We will have also, for example, Prime Minister uh, Tusk from uh, Poland. Uh, we will also have eight EU commissioners with uh, Oli Rehn on the economic side, together with Finance Minister Schoble of uh, Germany, the French Finance Minister, Italian Finance Minister, and also uh, the new presidency of EU uh, this spring uh, with the Irish uh, Prime Minister will be there. So I think we're very well covered on Europe. Moving a little bit east, we will also have the G20 presidency of this year, represented with Prime Minister Medvedev, and key 
cabinet ministers and deputy prime ministers. We also have great participation from Central Asia and Caucasus playing more and more of a strategic, geopolitically, and also economically an important role. Uh, president of Azerbaijan, we also have the President of Ukraine, and we will have also a top-notch delegation from uh, Turkey with Deputy Prime Minister Ali Babajan, but also Foreign Minister Davut Gulu that will be part of discussions on Syria and Middle East and North Africa. We have unprecedented participation from the new democracies in North uh, Africa, sharing with Davos also the reforms that are now being undertaken with the Prime Minister of Morocco, Prime Minister of Tunisia, Prime Minister of Libya, and also uh, the Prime Minister of Egypt with crucial uh, cabinet ministers. We also, for the first time, have the Prime Minister of Lebanon uh, sharing with us his views on the challenges in Levant, together with His Majesty the King of Jordan, the President of Israel, uh, Shimon Peres, and also uh, the Prime Minister of Qatar that is playing more and more of a central role in this part of the world. Africa, uh, six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world are African, and um, we have a lot of business interest also to invest in Africa. So it's very interesting to see that there is less focus on OIDA and more on the great opportunities on this continent. 10 head of states and government from Africa will be there to discuss the Africa uh, agenda in a, in a global context with President Suma and eight cabinet ministers from South Africa, President Goodluck Jonathan um, from Nigeria with Ka five cabinet ministers, also with Finance Minister Ngozi. The new uh, Prime Minister of Ethiopia will also be there, and Prime Minister Swangarai from Zimbabwe that is now also facing an election uh, in the spring. The fastest growing countries in uh, Asia uh, will be there in ASEAN. Uh, we have a special focus on ASEAN this year with uh, the President of the Philippines, Prime Minister of uh, Malaysia, Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand, Vice President of uh, Myanmar, Deputy Prime Minister of Laos, and I could continue. Of course, after the elections in, in Japan that just took place, there is a lot of interest in what are the reforms being now undertaken by uh, Prime Minister Abe and his team. Um, on Saturday in Davos, we will have uh, the Trade and Industry Minister, Mete Minister, and also the minister in charge of the reforms will be there uh, to share uh, the new agenda. We also have uh, good Chinese participation uh, from the Central Bank and also from um, NDRC. Davos will take place uh, 24 hours after the inauguration uh, in the US. We're expecting uh, four um, cabinet level secretaries with us uh, in uh, Davos and also a strong delegation from the Hill seven uh, U.S. senators, with, including uh, McCain, but also uh, seven representatives uh, from the host, including Eric Cantor, uh, the uh, head of um, uh, the, the majority leader uh, in the host of representatives. From Latin America, we will have three presidents and uh, very strong delegations uh, from the fast-growing economies of Latin America. As also Professor Schwab mentioned, we will have uh, 40 head of civil society uh, organizations, including uh, the most important ones, Amnesty International, Greenpeace, um, Transparency International. We, for the first time, we have also co-chairman of Davos that is from civil society who get label from Transparency International. We have faith leaders and we also have the important labor uh, leaders uh, globally. And of course, all the young people representing more than 50% of the global uh, population under age of uh, 27, the new community of global shapers that we initiated last year, no, with more than 208 hubs in 208 of the fastest growing cities in the world. Borga, thank you very much. Um, my colleague Alois Fingi is now going to talk about the other side of, of participation in Davos. He's kindly picking up the baton from uh, our other colleague Robert Greenhill, who's in the front row. He has literally 
uh, hot-footed it from a transatlantic flight from Geneva Airport. So he'll be available afterwards to give you some more detail on, on business participation. Alice is also going to fill us in on uh, another uh, key uh, element of Davos, which is the forum's open forum, which is now in its 11th year and has become an increasingly strong uh, interface between the forum and the global public. So uh, can you just uh, talk us through both business participation and that interesting open forum agenda? Right. Thank you, Adrian. Well, we have heard before just how impressive uh, the lineup will be with regards to public figures, but also other uh, stakeholders that we always uh, welcome in, in Davos. And uh, we are actually, out of the total of 2,500 uh, participants, we have 1,600 business leaders uh, in, in Davos, about 1,000 uh, of these 1,600 business leaders will actually be CEOs or chairs of their respective companies. We will have really a very broad representation of all different sectors of, of business represented, uh, virtually all areas, uh, different industry sectors, different uh, service organizations will be uh, represented in Davos. But we will also have a very good representation when it comes to, to geography. Uh, I think we will see a very strong presence of business leaders from Brazil, from Russia, from India, from China, from South Africa, additionally, obviously, to the strong uh, participation that we've always seen with business leaders from Europe and from North America. I think what also uh, is important to highlight uh, that together with these uh, businesses and business leaders, these members and partners, we work on projects and initiatives throughout the year. And I'd like to take the opportunity to highlight three initiatives that we're particularly proud of and that we've worked on the last year and that will have a particular uh, place also this year's in Davos. The first initiative I'd like to highlight is, uh, we call, is called Grow Africa. It is something that we have launched at our African summit in 2011, and I think it really took off last year, where towards the end of the year, uh, the G8 uh, countries have actually pledged uh, a sum of $3 billion for investments in Africa. And this, uh, the focus of that initiative is really on food security, and we will give that initiative a particular place uh, in, in Davos. The second initiative is around climate change. Uh, at the Rio Plus 20 meeting, we have convened a coalition called the Friends of Rio Plus 20. And the purpose of that coalition is really to establish a fund that will enable investment in green technology in emerging markets. And we expect now to, to add towards this fund the sum of roughly 500 million and also that will be a key topic in Davos. The third one already Professor Schwab uh, mentioned it, the gender parity uh, topic is really important for us and we're very proud about the participation uh, of uh, female leaders in uh, Davos. Last year we launched three gender parity task forces in Mexico, one in Turkey and one in Japan. And we'll also have a good number of sessions uh, to that topic in Davos. Lastly, I'd like to share with you uh, our uh, enthusiasm around the Open Forum uh, initiative that we've had. As Adrian said, it's the 11th year now. The Open Forum is really for the population of Davos and for the population of Switzerland. Everybody can attend these Open Forum sessions. Uh, we expect for these sessions throughout the four days roughly 2,500 participants joining these sessions. And just to name a few that we believe are of particular interest this year in Switzerland uh, and also in Europe, maybe one session around employment, so one session will be titled Unemployed or Unemployable. Uh, a second session I'd like to highlight will be around mega sports events as Switzerland is uh, pondering a bit for Olympic Winter Games. We believe that's a very timely uh, topic. And maybe a third example will be uh, a session on the war against obesity. Uh, so again, the Open Forum is, is a, an event that we organize also in recognition of all the support that we have from Davos and uh, from Switzerland. Thanks, Alois. And um, 
just to, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the work of the forum, the uh, Global Gender Gap Report is an annual feature the forum uh, develops, which looks at the gap between uh, men and women uh, across the world. That's a kind of keynote part of, of the forum's output, and uh, we build on that work in Davos, and obviously um, it's, it underpins our work in the area of competitiveness. Uh, can I just turn now to Jennifer Blanke, our chief economist, just to uh, draw out some of the other themes on the economic front that will be developed in Davos and some of the reports that will contribute to the meeting. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Adrian. In addition to the measures that Alois has just mentioned, actually the annual meeting program is going to be based in large part on a number of initiatives that were actually taking place over the course of 2012. And Alois has mentioned a few of them. I'd like to give you a few other highlights that are quite important, we think. Um, starting with a project that I have been actually personally involved in, uh, the Competitiveness and Europe teams are producing a new report that we're going to be launching in Davos called Rebuilding Europe's Competitiveness. It builds on a recent book that was published by Professor Schwab, uh, and it will be launched on Thursday, January 24th. The underlying basis and, and idea behind this, this book or this report is that uh, when you look at Europe uh, and you look at the financial and economic woes that the region is facing, uh, it in large part can be traced uh, to a competitiveness deficit in the region. Uh, and so what the report does is it identifies some of the areas where the deficit is most pronounced and then looks at policies uh, and practices that have already been implemented in individual European countries that if you know, sort of extended and implemented in other parts of Europe would really be important in terms of providing a boost uh, to Europe's uh, economic prospects. Now the report will be used in a number of sessions at the annual meeting uh, and bringing together leaders from all different you know, actors, uh, civil society, business, and government who are interested in boosting Europe's competitiveness and placing Europe on a stronger growth path. Now, you, Russia's competitiveness, or at least its economic prospects, uh, is the focus of another report that we will be coming out with in Davos. Uh, and this is going to be called Scenarios for the Russian Federation. Uh, and it was developed in close cooperation with Russian industry leaders, uh, business, uh, business leaders, political leaders, but also investors and experts. Uh, and what it's, it's based upon uh, our very well-established scenarios methodology. Uh, and it will be looking sort of out to 2030 at what are the prospects uh, for the Russian economy. What's quite exciting about this report is that it will be launched in a major plenary session where Prime Minister Medvedev will be there to react to the findings uh, and also to provide his and others who are in the session their thoughts about what are the prospects for Europe's economy going forward. And of course, this session will be live streamed. Um, turning from regional to global issues, uh, clearly, if you think about global trade, the world is trying to pick itself up from the inertia of the Doha round, uh, and there's a lot of effort uh, around the world to really, you know, sort of push uh, for uh, enhanced trade around the world. Now, this has been a focus uh, in terms of enabling trade at the World Economic Forum for a number of years, uh, and one of the specific areas that's of particular interest is the whole concept of facilitating trade within supply chains. Now, this is important because one still sometimes thinks, perhaps not in this room, uh, but one sometimes still thinks about trade as trade in one product that's produced in one country entirely and then shipped to one other country, whereas, of course, today, you know, it's much more complicated than that. There are long supply chains where there are many different components or efforts made in different countries where things are shipped over multiple borders before they finally make it to the final customer. So what our team working on supply chains in the forum has done is they have been quantifying uh, what would be the benefits of actually reducing barriers to such supply chain uh, trade. Uh, and this will be uh, launched in a report called Enabling Trade, Valuing Growth Opportunities. That will be launched on Wednesday, January 24, uh, 23rd. And this will provide the basis for a number of sessions throughout the meeting, uh, bringing together those people who are really interested in understanding how trade can be used to restore growth uh, and increase prosperity around the world. 
Now, of course, those are a number of issues that one might expect to see at the annual meeting, um, but as we've already heard, you know, civil society voices are, of course, already involved in all of these projects, and it's a very important um, you know, project for the World Economic Forum to engage very closely with civil society. Uh, and so this year, we're taking this even a step further in terms of producing a major report, also based on the, uh, the methodology of scenarios called the future role of civil society. And this will be looking at how, you know, if you look at trends in economics, technology, society, the environment, and so on and so forth, how this will change the way that civil society engages with business and government in coming up with the sorts of uh, solutions to our collective problems around the world. So, I mean, basically, these are four of the reports that we'll be coming out with in Davos that will provide, you know, the basis for discussions and also action. Uh, and I hope it does provide some sense of where some of our research priorities are right now. Thanks. Jennifer, thank you very much. Uh, we have about 15 minutes or so for some questions. If I can ask you when you have a question, just to identify yourself by raising your hand, telling us your name and your organization. I also have a number of colleagues uh, in uh, the front row who can help provide some additional support on any uh, issues you might have. And there will obviously be time for individual interviews after this press conference ends. But can I just get a sense of who has questions in the room? Can we start with the gentleman in the corner on the right? Yes, uh, Dr. Schwab, uh, this is Jamil Shade from Brazil. My question is about emerging countries. Uh, how do you see the prospect of growth uh, in this scenario that you're looking for dynamism again, uh, that this dynamism perhaps did not occur as much as was perhaps uh, envisaged by some? And in the specific case of Brazil, uh, it was a very uh, low growth this year. What does, what, what does this show uh, that perhaps the growth was overestimated? Thanks for that. And can I just take the question from the person in the middle? They had the hand up. Gentleman just there. Yeah. Uh, Dmitry Chufilia, Russian news agency TASS. Uh, if there is some uh, special meaning of uh, sp this special session of uh, Russian scenarios, uh, why it was uh, planned for this year, if there are some problems with Russian economics, or could you tell your reasons, please? Okay, well, Russia obviously has the G20. Borga, can you just uh, perhaps address that issue on uh, Russia and the importance of Russia in the Russian scenarios work? Um, so um, in the summer, uh, we agreed uh, with uh, Russian government, but also uh, with our key stakeholders in, in Russia, uh, the young global leaders, the global shapers, and the business communities, that we were to develop different scenarios for Russia moving forward uh, post uh, the presidential elections. So we developed uh, these uh, three scenarios uh, on the economic development of Russia in close collaboration also with uh, Russian uh, professors and academics. And in October, we had a very well-attended roundtable in Moscow where we brainstormed around these three uh, scenarios, where we had also uh, Prime Minister Medvedev, uh, three uh, deputy prime ministers, and uh, also cabinet uh, ministers there together with the international business community and based on the outcome of this meeting we will now present these three scenarios in the presence of Prime Minister Medvedev in Davos and we will then have an interactive discussion on Russia moving forward now as a WTO member and all the opportunities but also the challenges that this vast uh, country continent is facing. On specific country issues, I would just refer you, obviously, to the Global Competitiveness Report, which basically details in very great uh, detail the specifics that the forum identifies as being drivers and deficits in different economies' uh, competitiveness. And that's really, if you like, the answer that the forum has in those terms. Sir? And I, uh, coming back to your question, but before doing so, I just want to add, uh, related to Russia, I think there's a special interest on Russia next year as being in the chair of the G20. And as it had become a tradition, starting with the Koreans, the French, the Mexicans, uh, Davos will be some kind of a launching pad 
for the uh, G20 agenda. Uh, so the Russian, the very strong Russian delegation um, is actually uh, uh, related to two purposes. First, to discuss the scenario, and second, also uh, to present uh, the Russian ideas about uh, the objectives for the G20 next year. Um, if we look at the developing countries or the emerging markets, I think we are very proud that over the years, starting very early, we always, being a multi-stakeholder organization, have given great room to the integration of, uh, <laughs> uh, of emerging countries. Um, as an economist, I have to say, your question, um, we, uh, coming back to your question, low growth and so on, of course there's a concern uh, whether those uh, emerging countries may be caught in a trap, the middle income trap, as uh, I don't want to develop it further. But let's not forget, next year, the, or this year, actually, 2013, despite the crisis, the prognosis is around 4% global growth. If we take the just below 4%, yeah. hopefully more. If we, if we look at the, uh, where is the global growth coming from? Still mainly from the emerging countries, from the BRIC countries. Uh, but we should not forget all the next followers group behind the BRIC countries. I mean, uh, Philippines, we, we, we have the president, by the way, of the Philippines in, in that was. Um, uh, Indonesia and so on. So the um, emerging countries are very important for global growth. Just uh, following up on that side of the house, uh, gentlemen in the front, gentlemen in the middle, and gentlemen just at, uh, at the back there. If we can take those three. Uh, hello, Marat Chagorowski from Geneva. Professor Schwab, thank you very much for Sorry, inviting can us. Sorry, you just tell us your... your uh, Marat Chagorowski from, from Geneva, yeah, here. From which publication? Actually, independent journalists are working for different publications, okay. yeah. Um, regular guest here as well. Um, I noticed that the main theme of this meeting is resilient dy dynamism. So um, what I know of resilience, it's rather a psychological term, and which has been made recently very popular here by a professor called Boris Cyrulnik. You certainly heard of him. Uh, maybe even invite him. I haven't seen him in the list, but uh, I mean, here you are sitting on the chair. I would imagine, uh, do you see yourself as a shrink, if I may say so, uh, to the global economy? And, I saw that uh, the pr a, Professor a, Kahneman is going to... Psychiatrist. Psychiatrist, psychiatrist, yeah. Professor Kahneman, Nobel Prize laureate, he's great, he's going to speak. Maybe you have some more conference on that, if you can comment. And another, uh, what I was appealed by the co-chairs, actually, there are two chairmen of companies, like Coca-Cola, you're talking, Alois Swing, you said about obesity. Well, Coca-Cola even admitted now, recently, that um, they were part of the obesity problem, especially in the US. And also chairman of the UBS. UBS, as you know, uh, has been convicted recently in many different uh, affairs, paying billions uh, of fines. So um, is it for you uh, like a step forward to, to, to tell them, listen, guys, now you have to, to do better? Or um, I don't know how you explain that. Thanks and, for that. I and, think that's, yeah. there's two questions probably enough uh, to be more than food for thought. Gentlemen, just behind. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. I'm, I'm Hiro Maigawa. I'm working for the Asahi Shimbun, Japanese newspaper. And uh, I have a question in general. Uh, as uh, Mr. Howell said, how do we get back to uh, the path? And uh, if you look at all these uh, theme of resilience dynamism, uh, w what do you mean by getting back? Would that mean more growth or more something else? Uh, because from uh, we all know that the the world economy's driver is from e emerging economy and possible developing countries. But uh, living, uh, who has raised in a developed world, like me, it looks a little bit grim. And the, how the, the developed world could cope with the world dynamism that we see less growth. Thank you. Okay, and there's just a gentleman at the back of the middle. Um, my name is David de Berli. I work for Daily here in Geneva, Tribune de Genève. Um, Mr. Schwab, you're very optimistic about Europe 
But uh, in a way, Europe is also a, a, a catastrophe, um, in, in, unable to, to reform itself. Do you think that Europe is going to save... Um, what are the drivers that, that are going to save Europe? Is it Europe itself or, or Russia or the BRICS or the outside? And uh, you mentioned also a very high participation from Germany, for example. But France uh, just sends one, one minister to Davos. Are you uh, disappointed cool, cool, by that? Cool. Okay, there's a couple of questions there. Just to start back at the beginning, uh, you've spoken before, I know, about Davos as a kind of therapy for, for world leaders and for CEOs. Uh, do you want to just uh, expand on that perhaps slightly, sir? No, it's very, it's very, very clear as the, as the world economy. Uh, is based, and the future of the world economy is based on restoring trust. Restoring trust in leaders, restoring trust in our future. And this means we have to develop again, we have to move out of this uh, crisis mood, uh, which is amplified by the media also. Um, we have to look, what is the longer term future? What is the longer term future? And uh, uh, coming back to your other remark, I mean, uh, uh, certainly, um, Mr. Axel Weber um, uh, deserves praise, as well as uh, the chairman of Coca-Cola, for doing now the necessary things. Um, um, coming um, to, to the question of our uh, Japanese, I would refer to, to my colleagues here. Yeah, and I think um, just on that point, I mean, it, Davos, as we say, often is a place where people are, have to confront other interests and other stakeholders and actually interact with them. And that, we think, is one of the most important aspects of, of, of the meeting. Lee, just... I think on that last point uh, that you raised about where the path, I think, indeed, growth is important, but I th what you'll see through the program is there, there are some... Um, conditions of this, this future growth that we aspire for, and those are around its sustainability and its equity. Uh, the, you know, it's not just pure GDP growth, it's a growth that is indeed sustainable and of course is equitable. And I think that is very much in the program and, and it's part of the dimensions of the conversations around what to do to get back on track. But I think it does go back to the fundamental point about, um, we, we, indeed there are a lot of challenges, but we can't be paralyzed, you know, paralysis through analysis of these challenges, but indeed, take some uh, bold steps, and we're starting to see that. And uh, I think um, this is the moment, really, to do one thing, and that is at least share, have a shared definition of the problem, because you can get to a shared solution. And, and all of these uh, issues on the global agenda are indeed uh, impacting across all stakeholders, and they are multidisciplinary. So you have to have that, uh, uh, that prerequisite dialogue to at least define it together so that you can actually solve it together. I think, too, Jennifer, just to bring you in here, you, you identified a couple of reports that are launching in Davos which are really addressing that pessimism and giving a more optimistic uh, potential outlook. Yeah, I mean, based on whether countries actually do what they need to do, because I think that what we see is that very often uh, countries actually know what need to be done in order to improve their growth prospects, but then somehow they can't get it done. Um, because it's very difficult to, to make the reforms, to make the changes that are necessary. And so I think, I would say we, we're sort of addressing this in two ways at Davos. Uh, number one, just through this multi-stakeholder dialogue, getting all the different voices around the table and talking about it and saying, especially in Europe but elsewhere as well, we know what we need to do, how are we going to do this together, because generally one actor can't do it on its own. Another one, as I'd mentioned, is the fact that we do see things that have been done elsewhere. We do see that certain countries have been able to implement reforms and investments in the sorts of activities that do ju jumpstart them. So what we hope to do, and more and more going forward, but also at the annual meeting, is to put together those experiences and inspire countries uh, and regions from the sorts of experiences that have been seen elsewhere. Thanks very much. And just to address the, the point, Bulger, on, on French representation, we have a very, very strong French business representation and, of course, across civil society academia. Do you want to just... Yeah, and, and there is um, the, the key interest now in, in France is how France is addressing the necessary reforms. And I think we have the two uh, uh, very relevant uh, ministers in that respect. We have the finance minister and also the innovation uh, minister. So uh, them sharing their agenda uh, on, on these uh, issues is, is very important. The same is also for Japan. As I mentioned, the new cabinet and with the Abe in economics, we'll have the finance, we will have then the Meti minister, the economy and trade minister, and also the minister know in, 
in charge of reforms will be with us uh, in Davos. So I think there will be uh, key findings coming out of this. And on the Eurozone in general, I, I would say that uh, we should not underestimate the reforms being now undertaken. Some of the periphery countries are now turning deficits into surpluses. We're also seeing that the labor unit uh, costs are falling quite dramatically. And uh, hopefully this will also then uh, result in uh, more substantial growth at the end of 2013, something that also the board of ECB uh, said they were hopeful for at their last board meeting when they decided to keep the interest rate at the same level as uh, before Christmas. Thank you. Lee? I was just going to say that we also have a great opportunity uh, for the regions that we mentioned to have sessions that we've built in partnership, and these sessions will be broadcast uh, for, uh, in those countries. For example, we're working with NHK on, on a session that will be, of course, aired in Japan. We're actually doing this for the first time in France, uh, even in, also in Africa, uh, et cetera, uh, in other countries uh, and regions. So I just want to point out that I think there's a lot to Jennifer's point where there's things happening in other parts of the world where we can actually have those discussions but then ha and, and challenge all the insights and really the innovations uh, and share them across uh, uh, borders. Thank you. Um, we're coming to the end of the session, but I just try and squeeze in some questions from the back of the room, just working backwards to the middle, if we can. And I know, uh, being a former journalist, one loves to ask more than one question, but if we can just keep them very brief, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gabriela Sotomayor from Mexican News Agency. Uh, Mr. Schwab, uh, did you invite to Davos the candidates that are contending to lead the WTO? And I would like to know if they are going. And in your view, which are the characteristics that the new director of WTO should have? Thank okay. you. Question on the WTO. Uh, Mr. Schwab, my name is Ravi Kant. I represent Washington Trade Daily and Economic and Political Weekly. Uh, you have stated uh, three major wishes from this meeting, namely global uh, uh, platform for optimism, global trusteeship, civic mindedness, feeling the greater responsibility and moral accountability. All these three wishes are primarily coming because the economic model that we have followed over the last 30, 40 years have failed to generate these three main traits that now you want to see uh, sort of committed to in this meeting. Thank you. And your question is? Yes, the question, but you just made a statement. Is no, there a I question? I've not made a statement. I said, Mr. Schaub, you stated three wishes. Yes. And these yeah. three wishes, have they come because of the failure of the economic okay, model? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Sorry, my apologies. It's my hearing. Gentleman in the middle. Just there with his hand up. Okay. Simeon Bennett from Bloomberg News. Um, Mr. Schwab, you said that, um, that there is a fatigue with globalism now, even a backlash. Um, can you just uh, expand on what you meant by that and what do you think the signs of that are? Thank you. See, okay, thanks. And then just finally, gentleman just in the middle. Uh, Professor Schwab, uh, Tom Miles from Reuters News Agency. Um, I wanted um, what risk you see from a world uh, awash with easy money courtesy of central banks. Um, I don't think this was really uh, touched upon in the, in the risk report, but um, uh, is there a risk of markets mispricing uh, is there, are there signs of markets mispricing risk now and uh, risk of inflation reviving? Um, and also on, on the, a question on the, um, the participants. In the last few years, there's a sense of some participants uh, sort of lying low, um, staying away because of contrition, because of the financial crisis. But, um, I mean, it, although corporate scandals have continued, um, you're reporting a rush back to Davos. Do you think that sense of humility and contrition among the, uh, the plutocracy has, has disappeared? Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, just on the WTO point, we uh, uh, respect and, uh, and love other international organisations, but being an impartial organisation, we don't tend to comment on choices for uh, those particular roles. Can I just ask you, uh, sir, about the, the sense of fatigue and uh, that point on, on Davos this year, and, and is it responding to uh, perhaps uh, a sense of failure in, in previous years in the global economy? Yes, sir. Um uh, I mean, you just have to look at the facts. Look at the outcome of the Qatar meeting on um, environment. Uh, look where we stand with the world trade negotiations. Uh, study some of the uh, communiques uh, of the G8 and 
G20 uh, over the last years and uh, look at the progress made. So um, it's a fact that we, in some way we are blocked in terms of making progress on addressing the real global issues in a collaborative uh, way. Uh, so there are small, small steps which we achieved, but uh, it looks uh, that uh, countries with the economic uh, crisis have become much more uh, egoistic again, more nationalistic, and this of course uh, creates a situation where everybody tries to optimize nationally uh, the situation, which means a sub-optimization on a global level. Um, just to come back to one, that is a question um, from over here. Um, the forum always had the philosophy that um, uh, it is entrepreneurship which drives economic and social progress, economic development and social progress. So I don't think we have to change drastically the model of economic growth. We have to improve it. And we have to put back at the center entrepreneurship. Thank you. I would just say, uh, Tom, regarding participation, just looking at some of those key elements, it's actually remained remarkably consistent from financial services and banking over the past five years, having looked at those numbers. Um, but I think you can see this year from the presence of uh, Huguette Labelle uh, as co-chair and also if you look at the work that I know doesn't uh, necessarily always catch people's attention as a headline, uh, but the work we do on our Partner Against Corruption initiative and the, the way that the Global Competitors Report stresses transparency and good governance as really key drivers of national competitiveness. Um, you know, the forum's history in this respect is, is a very strong one in terms of uh, emphasizing the ways in which those elements can, can really improve both corporate, business, and national, uh, and therefore global competitiveness. Adrian, I just want to come back rapidly to the question uh, related to um, the financial situation. Um, that's exactly why I'm looking forward to go myself to Davos. Um, there are so many issues where we do not yet know the answers. Uh, like uh, the question you raise, will we go into an inflationary environment? So I'm looking forward to Davos to discuss with those present and to shape afterwards my own opinion. And after the meeting, I hope to give you a very qualified answer. And, and you just, uh, Lee, you were the editor of the Global yeah, Risk Report. Exactly. So well, I'm not allowed to pick on... my, my favorite session, but one is related to this, and we will have a debate. A forum uh, will have a debate in Davos around really what is the looking at the near term and the long term uh, impact of, uh, of this sort of bold, innovative monetary policy that we're seeing in parts of the world. And that will be a very much uh, one of the first debates we have in Davos. Great. Uh, we look forward to seeing uh, as many of, as possible of you as we can there. Thank you for being with us this morning. For everyone watching, I hope you'll be able to follow up on the website. Uh, thanks, everyone, and we'll be able to do individual interviews after this. So thanks to all of you again. Thanks to my Thank colleagues. You Thank you.